Thank you. Uh, I'm no helicopter expert, but I asked that question when I was over in Afghanistan about a year or two ago. And I was told that the uh, helicopter in question is just a better fit for the Afghan military in terms of maintenance and capability. So that may not be the case. If, we, if it's an American helicopter fits the needs the best, I'm all for, for, for them buying from us. But that's what I was told. So be, I'd like to hear more. Uh, Senator Blumenthal made a, a very good observation. I don't think any of us who want to be more involved in Syria believe that boots on the ground is a good idea. Haven't been requested, and certainly we're not anywhere near that point for me. But uh, I guess what I would like to do is kind of build on what he asked. He asked a very good question. You, you basically said, Mr. Secretary, that Assad should be viewed as a war criminal. Uh, I think that's a good analysis to take. The UN International Independent International Commission of Aquarium on Syria uh, in February issued a report, 72 pages, but this is sort of the sum and substance of it to me. Such violations, talking about the atrocities, gross human rights violations, originated from policies and directives issued at the highest levels of the armed forces and the government. Do you agree with that? Is that a pretty good characterization of? Yes. Sir, yes. Yeah, well, I, I think it is. And, you know, Senator Collins and I were talking, you know, the dilemma is if you go after him, maybe it entrenches him. I've come to believe in situations like this that he's going to do what he's going to do. And if he were rational, he wouldn't be doing what he's doing. But from his point of view, he obviously believes he's rational, and that's trying to just wait us all out and kill as many people as he can and hope we get tired of it and walk away. Uh, I think it would be really good for the Syrian people to know that the international community views what's being done to them as an outrage and that they would get support morally and otherwise from, from the idea that we all saw the abuses against them is unacceptable. So it, I don't know how it affects Assad, but I sure think it would help them. Now, let's, uh, let's get into the, the situation of what happens after he leaves. Do you really believe, Secretary Panetta and General Dempsey, that the people are going through this pain and suffering at the end of the day to replace Assad with Al-Qaeda? No. No, nor do I. Yeah. The real concern we have is that there are minorities in the country, the Alawites in particular, that could really be on the receiving end some reprisals if we don't think about this. Is that right? That's correct. Now, in our efforts to find out what happens next, have we, are we guiding the Syrian opposition in any way to sort of form a plan? Are we involved with them? Well, that's, I mean, obviously that's, <laughs> that's the, the biggest challenge is to, uh, because we are dealing with a, uh, with a pretty disparate group of uh, But are we trying opposition. to create order out of chaos? Yeah. See, somebody's going to bet on the stock that follows Assad, and I want to be on the ground floor of this new enterprise. That's right. I don't want to just show up after it's over. I want to get ready now and try to mold the outcome, and you don't have to have boots on the ground to do that. But when it comes to... Um, what happens next? Uh, do you believe that if Assad was replaced by the will of the international community, led by the United States, that that may, be do, that may do more good regarding Ar Iran's ambitions for nuclear weapons than sanctions? If they saw the international community take their ally down, that we had the resolve to do it? Well, uh uh, let me tell you, it would uh, certainly add to the impact of the sanctions to have this happen uh, in convincing Iran help. that they're alone. Yeah, I just can't help but believe if, if their ally, Syria, went down because the international community led by the United States said enough is enough and did reasonable things to take him down, that that wouldn't have a, a positive impact. Now, uh, when it comes to planning, Senator Blumenthal asked a lot of good questions about what we're doing and what we're planning. Am I wrong to assume that from your testimony, the President of the United States has not requested a military plan regarding engaging Syria? No, that's not correct. He, the President of the United States, through the National Security Staff, has asked us to begin the commander's estimate, the estimate of okay. the situation. Well, that's good. So there is movement and process in DOD to provide the President some options. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Now, when it comes to um, uh, China and Russia, 
Do you believe they will ever change their tune at the UN? That we'll ever get them on board for a UN resolution uh, like we had in Libya regarding Syria? I, you know, I, I don't think it's totally out of the question. I, I think uh, uh, both countries. Uh, if you were a betting man, and both I know countries you're not, have been embarrassed. I think by yeah. by the stand that they took on yep. the UN resolution. But they they can withstand a lot of embarrassment. Yeah. Uh, so if you were a betting man, do you believe that they will ever come on board? I, you know, uh, if Russia wants to maintain its contacts with Syria, maintain their port, and have some uh, involvement with uh, whatever government replaces Assad, uh, I think uh, they might be thinking about uh, an approach that would allow them to uh, uh, to have uh, some impact on where this goes. So I, I don't rule it out that, uh, you know, that they wouldn't. Would you uh, say that run. should not be our only option, that we should come up with a contingency plan in case Russia doesn't sure. wake up one day and realize they're on the wrong side of history, that we have another way of engaging without China and Russia? Absolutely. Now let's talk about the Arab League. Uh, the Arab League has changed mightily in the last year, haven't they, given their involvement in the Mideast? They sure have. Do you believe is generated by the Arab Spring that the Arab League was sort of an association of uh, dictatorial regimes that now are betting on the right side of history, and they see Assad as being on the wrong side of history, and that's incredibly encouraging? Absolutely. Don't you think in our long-term national security interests, we have a window in time here to marry up with the Arab League in terms of military, humanitarian, economic follow-on assistance to the countries that have people who are saying, I'm tired of being led by dictators, and are we doing enough to seize that moment in history? Uh, I, I can assure you that uh, Secretary Clinton and I are working with our uh, Arab League partners to try to do everything we can to uh, uh, develop and maintain uh, the coalition that was established with Libya, but to maintain it as a continuing influence over what happens elsewhere in that region. And my final thought is that if the slaughter continues, I do believe that the world, including the United States, has the capability to neutralize the slaughter through air power. And given the way the world is and the way Syria is, is there a likelihood even a remote possibility that if we engaged the artillery forces and the tank drivers who are killing people who basically have AK-47s, that maybe the other people in tanks would get out and quit if we blew up a few of them? There's certainly that possibility. I think that is a high likelihood, so thank you both for your service. Thank you, Senator.